Hello, Milkweed Nation. Welcome back to Grow Milkweed Plants Podcast. Saturday, February 18th, 2023. I'm your host, Brad Grimm. Today, I'm going to be taking you back to the International Western Monarch Summit 2023 that was held in San Luis Obispo, January 20th through 22nd of this year. So yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, on the last podcast, episode 51, I talked about the uh, highlights from the first keynote speaker, Dr. David James from uh, Washington State University. And today I'm going to talk about uh, second keynote speaker, Dr. Myron Zalucki. Dr. Myron Zalucki is uh, one of the international presenters from University of Queensland. And Dr. Myron Zalucki did a presentation titled, Will Monarchs Go Extinct? Um, that wrapped up the first day of the summit. And then uh, later after I talk about the uh, kind of the six points that I made note of from Dr. Zalecki's presentation, I'll continue on to the Saturday morning schedule um, up until the first break. And then we'll continue on in later episodes going through the rest of the Monarch Summit. So Dr. Myron Zalecki said, based on the uh, title of his talk, Will Monarchs Go Extinct? His answer to that, no. He didn't make it real complicated. It's, uh, he said, not for now. There's a lot of reasons that what he said is accurate. Um, monarchs have worldwide distribution. There's monarchs in Australia where uh, Dr. Zalecki is from. You can see them in Queensland. And, um, they're a tropical butterfly, so all over the tropics from Hawaii, Guam, even uh, Asian, Asian countries have uh, butterflies similar to the, Ameri you know, the North American monarch. And uh, so not going extinct. That's good news. A lot of people in the West were really concerned about extinction because the population count in uh, two years ago was 2,000 monarchs. So that was uh, a really low number. Um, called them functionally extinct. Uh, I mentioned the monarch count more recently is much higher. Second point that he had uh, made was uh, that mortality is highest from egg to second instar, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, that is the time in their life when they are the smallest. And generally, um, unless you're really small to the point where you can't be found, you're really vulnerable when you're small. So eggs get picked off by predators and first and second instars are eaten by predators as well. Uh, in addition to that, first instar and to some extent second instar, I believe. A lot of vulnerability to um, having their mouth sealed closed by the milkweed sap. And if you have the book um, from Dr. Anrag Argawal, he has some really good photographs in, in his book that will um, actually show basically the moments when a first instar caterpillar is biting into the milkweed and its mouth is um, like gummed up from the milkweed sap. So mortality is the highest from egg to second instar. He talks about the milkweed patch and he says that the patch is a pickup joint. It's a bar. There's uh, males patrolling the milkweed patch. There's females visiting the milkweed patch. And the males are patrolling a lot of times, especially in the spring and summer when they're of breeding age. Uh, they're looking to pair with the females that come to the milkweed. And so it is uh, a pickup joint. He didn't really go into a lot of detail about that. Just said that uh, that's his observation. Um, you might even observe if you spend a lot of time in a milkweed patch, if you have a male there and a second male shows up, uh, you might be able to imagine the first male can actually be kind of aggressive to the second male. And you could actually misinterpret that as 
pairing with a female when in fact they're actually fighting off a second male. So that's really interesting behavior. Uh, he says that monarchs in the West are associated with rivers and river valleys. Now, I, th I think I've gone over this in some detail um, years ago. So if you listen to some of the earlier episodes in the 10s and 20s, um, the Truckee River in Reno is always basically the first place that I see monarch activity. Because those monarchs, if they came over the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, they are generally following rivers and river valleys. So that's a really good point that he brought up. Uh, the next uh, thing he talked about is uh, how does uh, Asclepius speciosa respond to fire? Question mark. So that's that's an actual question. Um, basically, Dr. Zalucki said, hey, if you're in the West and you have Asclepius speciosa that goes through a fire event, like a wildfire, um, how does it respond to that fire? And there's not a lot of data about that. So we, we know a lot about uh, the Florida prayer, uh, Florida ecosystem. I mean, not me in particular, but I know that like Savannah milkweed and some of those other milkweeds that grow in uh, the pine forest that is frequently, uh, frequently has uh, burn events, that that milkweed actually responds really well to that. We don't know exactly in the West if uh, showy milkweed responds favorably to fire events. My guess would be that it does okay, but a lot of times I think it might sit dormant for that year of the fire and then not grow back until the following year. Um, not knowing about the way that showy milkweed responds to fire, uh, it's kind of indicative of many things in the West. Uh, so Dr. Zalecki says, get a handle on distribution and abundance of milkweed. If you want to understand the Western monarchs, the Western monarch migration, and how that interaction occurs with the milkweed, get a handle on distribution and abundance of milkweed in the West. Data, data, data. Need more data in the West so that we can make informed decisions about things. All right, that was the end of the first day. And um, everybody at the event could really tell that there was gonna be a lot, there's gonna be a lot of information. Uh, so we're gonna take a short break. And when we come back, we're gonna talk about the morning of Saturday, January 21st. And there were a whole bunch of speakers. I'll go over them in just a moment. So in the morning, um, it started kind of bright and early at 8.30 in the morning. There was a nice breakfast provided. And the first uh, person to present was Becca Lucas of the YYT Northern Chumash Tribe. And uh, Becca Lucas did a presentation titled Environmental Stewardship Stewardship of the Northern Chumash. So I'll just uh, read a few things that I wrote down from her presentation. Uh, the YYT Northern, I'm abbreviating that by the way, because um, if I'm going to pronounce these words without training, it's going to be, um, I'm going to do a very poor job. So I'm not going to pronounce, pronounce the YYT North Chumash tribe, but I will link to their website and y you can um, try to pronounce it. Um, obviously she said it a few times, but that wasn't enough for me to catch how it was pronounced. I'm sure there's some nuances to the language that I just won't grasp. So the YYT Northern Chumash tribe is not recognized by us federal government. They have been documented to care for the land for 10,000 years. This is our promise. 
return the land to us and the trees will stand until they fall down on their own. So when I say this is our promise, of course, her words, um, the, the request to return the land to them is related to uh, a specific part of the California coast. Um, this is from their website. It says the Diablo Canyon power plant stands at the edge of the continent above cliffs that plunge into the Pacific Ocean. A turbulent saltwater discharge flows from the nuclear plant and is lost in the foam of waves pushed in by the wind and tides. Otters still clasp hands among kelp beds. Oyster catchers nest on the rocky shores and sea lions chase down herring and rockfish. Badgers and coyotes den in the hills of coastal chaparral while gray whales pass close to the shore on their migrations. The only piece that is missing in the coast is the coast's first people, the YYT Northern Chumash tribe. Um, so that basically the um, Diablo Canyons is a land that th these people have been on documented for 10,000 years. And the thing that I took away most from uh, Becca Lucas's presentation was just the way that they spoke about the land and basically every manner of their tribe was for the betterment of the lands. And so um, I'm going to read uh, this next part of my notes. And I think you'll understand a little bit about what I was talking about when I said that. Farming and land management by the YYT and Americans is similar with one difference inputs that harm humans, animals, and plants is a modern invention and not done by the YYT. Whoa, that's powerful stuff. Um, that tribe is serious about land management and it kind of goes along with like how I summarize on my business card. If it's good for the butterflies, it's good for me. And what that means is basically no inputs that are going to be harming the land. If a butterfly can't survive, maybe it's not a good idea to be doing that to the land. And, you know, weed killer, herbicides, things like that. These are inputs by modern, modern Americans. It takes a lot of time to learn about land management in a natural way, um, generations. But uh, I think if we talk to people like the YYT, Northern Chumash tribe, and we learn from them, we could really get a lot of value from that and something to think about. So the second speaker in the morning uh, was um, Dr. Ek Del Val, a researcher from Mexico. And uh, Dr. Ek Del Val talked about efforts to conserve monarch butterflies in Mexico. Uh, he says, uh, he talks about his first experience, which is a powerful moment. So whether your first experience with monarchs was like me in 1997 in uh, California, seeing the monarchs in natural bridges, or you're down in Mexico, which was probably uh, very similar, maybe even on a grander scale. Uh, it, Dr. Ekvan Ekdel Val's um, experience was that in the 1970s, there were no roads. She hiked and found no butterflies. And uh, she returned to high school. And, um, oh, she went to high school and then she returned. And it was in uh, late winter, she found very active mating monarchs. Uh, let me go through that again because the notes were kind of confusing. I'm not a great note taker, but basically she had this experience where she was told about these monarchs. She brought a friend of hers. They were very young and they just hiked around the mountains um, most of the afternoon. But because today you can go down to Mexico and have a guided tour, they went down there and there was no guided tour. 
Um, there was no trails. And even if there was a path, it was not clearly marked. So they literally just hiked around the woods and never found the monarchs. And then some years later returned and was able to find the monarchs and had a transformative experience from that. So that was really cool. Um, it's hard for me to like convey that experience that the person had. Um, so they talked about in Mexico, the Oyamel fir are struggling and not that all the trees are struggling, but that the Oyamel fir is struggling. And so now they're planting, um, Oyamel fir, you know, because it is a staple tree in that area. However, they're also planting cypress, pine, and oak trees. So by supplementing with some other varieties of trees, they hope to basically have a forest um, that has more, more health in the trees. And of course, monarchs are roosting in the trees, so giving them some options is gonna be really good for the monarchs. So that's a really interesting that they're branching out with different trees. Um, brought up a question about avocados because a lot of people, even I've brought it up based on some news stories. Should you be concerned about the avocados that you're eating, where they're sourced from, and how they might have a negative impact on monarchs? She says, it would be nice to know where in Mexico your avocados came from. Most production is far from wintering sites in the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. Okay, I'm just going to let you decide. Most avocados come from production that is far from that area. Not all, just going to say not all, are those news stories about avocados from Mexico um, true? To some, yeah, they're, they're true. But the majority of your avocados are fine. So I still don't need avocado, whatever. Um, great presentation. Uh, that part where hiking around just looking for butterflies, I think a lot of us can relate to that. Uh, the third speaker that morning was uh, Dr. Ryan Norris, University of Guelph in Canada. So, um, you can see why this is an international Western Monarch Summit. Um, we had Dr. Myron Zalucki from Queensland, Australia, uh, Dr. Ek Delval from Mexico, and Dr. Ryan Norris now from Canada. So really multiple countries coming together here. Really interesting uh, dynamic. So Dr. Ryan Norris talks about the effects of neonicotinoid on the development, survival, reproductive output, and migratory orientation of monarch butterflies. So this is a 30 minute presentation. I'm gonna boil it down to about two minutes here. Um, so isotopes, hydrogen isotopes helps determine natal origin. Okay, so that's uh, basically he's describing one method of determining the natal origin of monarchs by um, the hydrogen isotopes. Now, they're also doing research where they're adding isotopes from bedrock and it aids, oh, sorry, it adds serious detail to the natal origin of monarchs. So what does that mean? Let me, let me try to illustrate this in a picture because there were pictures in the presentation. Basically, Hydrogen isotopes, I believe they vary by um, longitude. So as you go north and south, you have different kinds of hydrogen isotopes. And you get kind of a general idea like, oh, this one's from the Midwest and this one's from um, like the East Coast. Uh, maybe this one's clearly from Georgia. But it was really general, like the isotopes had a broad range so you, you couldn't get very specific, like you, you could be thousands of like up to 500,000 miles off or something like that. But then they added isotopes from bedrock and you could tell that it was from 
Texas, or you could tell that it was from Oklahoma. And so the amount of detail in these isotopes from bedrock added a lot of detail to um, tracking the natal origin or basically where it was born, where it ate its milkweed from. Fascinating research. Okay, so mm, let's see, mowing in Canada. Okay, mid-July, it creates egg laying. All right, so if you are in Canada, specifically South Ontario, Canada, my understanding is a great deal of uh, the population in Canada resides in like the very southern portions. So I'm going to guess that um, South Ontario has a rather large population. He says that if you're mowing in Canada, basically taking your milkweed and like, let's say you have a meadow growing with like um, common milkweed or showy milkweed. I forget where Ontario is. If you mow that down in mid-July, say July 15th, it will re-sprout and it creates egg laying. Monarchs are drawn to tender shoots of milkweed. This is just an excellent nugget of information. So July 15th, mow your milkweed down in Southern Ontario and you're gonna have extra eggs laid on those plants. Before you mow them, maybe check for eggs and move them to a different location. All right, so getting field realistic results in the lab is very difficult. A lot of these um, presenters are researchers and they're trying to get the best um, laboratory studies that represent real life situations. But Ryan Norris says getting field realistic results in the lab is very difficult, underlined, very difficult. Um, so keep that in mind as you're reading information from various studies. Dr. Ryan Norris says that neonicotinoids has the most impact on larvae. So we know the life cycle of the monarch, egg, larvae, five in stars, and then metamorphosis in a chrysalis followed by the adult. And then the cycle repeats. The larvae is the most uh, impacted by neonicotinoid herbicides and uh, pesticides. There is a 3% lower larval survival in treated sites. So if you have monarch larvae feeding on milkweed in proximity to neonicotinoids, you can count on a statistical death rate of 3% survival. So super good to know. All right, the third, let's see, one, two, three. The fourth speaker was Amanda Barth. Amanda Barth is a Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, WAFWA. I think she, she said it sounded great. Western Monarch Conservation Plan. Uh, this was her talk, Actions for Partners Across the West. So, oh, look at that. I got more pages on uh, Ryan Norris. Let's continue on with Ryan Norris. Higher egg laying in neonicotinoid treated sites. This preliminary conclusion is a neonicotinoid crop is an ecological trap. Oh, so there's more eggs and there's more mortality. So underlined ecological trap. Um, there is a, in Ontario, they do a, a monarch tracking program called MOTUS, M-O-T-U-S. MODIS flight tracking gives them incredible tracking results. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. I think it deserves its own kind of s subject. If I can get a link to MODIS flight tracking uh, where they maybe have some of the results of insects that they have tracked, I'm going to put that in the show notes. Uh, flight simulator, let's see, 26% south, radio tracking, 97% south. Okay, so there's two kinds of tracking for monarchs. 
um, they they tried using a flight simulator. You might have read a, a blog about that. Um, people have tried to duplicate the results, and flight simulator results are just uh, they're just kind of weird. Um, they're a highly laboratory kind of thing. Um, anyway, twenty six percent of monarchs in a flight simulator went south. Um, the assumption would be like a hundred percent would go south because they're migrating south. They're doing the testing in the fall. Um, so then this modus flight tracking is uh, radio tracking. So the radio tracking results, 97% went south. So 24 to 48 hours to recalibrate in the wild to establish orientation. Um, 97% went south when doing radio tracking. So basically they're kind of confused and then they fly south. So that was really, really neat to uh, hear that that's the case. Uh, define Clothanindia because it has complex effects on monarchs. Okay, so Clothanindia, Nandin. Uh, I believe this is some kind of a um, pesticide. Um, and it has really complex effects on monarchs. I, well, is it a pesticide? Or maybe it is one of the isotopes. Um, I'll have to look that up. There's, these people know a lot. I was just trying to learn while I was there. Um, and then let's see, field tests over labs. So lab tests basically can only do so much stuff. And then he really recommends multi-year studies because sometimes you get odd results in one particular year and a second year can really give you a lot better data. So that's good to know. All right. Uh, sorry. So we're moving ahead to Amanda Barth of, uh, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So Amanda, let's see one page. Okay. Western Monarch Conservation Plan 2019 through 2069. Man, Amanda Barth has laid out a plan. So the Western Monarch Conservation Plan is basically a uh, it's a document that can be used by uh, state and federal agencies in the West to um, kind of guide decisions over, I don't know, what is this, like a 50-year, 40-year period. Um, by 2029, a uh, five-year average of 500,000 winter population of monarchs is one of the goals. 50% site protection of winter sites. Um, UDAF, UDAF. Utah Pollinator Habitat Program, um, Idaho, Leita Soil and Water Conservation District, um, WAFA.org, and I've got her email address. So basically, Amanda has um, interagency communication with a lot of different partners in the West. So I mentioned this Utah Pollinator Habitat Program, and then in Idaho, the Leita Soil and Water Conservation District. These are all just little um, kind of puzzle pieces that are all working together to help the monarchs. Um, so it's really interesting. Good stuff that uh, state agencies are involved in this and the federal federal government because they own a lot of land out here in the West. All right, so that gets us to our first break. And uh, we're halfway through Saturday. Um, no, nope, not quite halfway. We're on our morning break. Well, this uh, podcast episode's gone on for a little bit, so I'm going to take a pause, and when we resume, we're going to finish up the morning with a presentation from Gail Morris, Patrick Anthony Guerrera, and uh, Francis uh, Villablanca. Um, and um, thanks for listening. This is episode 52 of Grow Milkweed Plants podcast. <laughs> 